Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Allahümme salli ve sallim ve zedu bârek ala seyyidina Muhammed. Ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sallim. So we're starting a new book this week. I don't think it will take that long. Um, <clears throat> it's called Prophetic Grappling. We'll talk about it when we get there, inshallah. This is not referring to, as some of the brothers and sisters apparently thought, this is not referring to grappling with your emotions. This is referring to actual fighting. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, alhamdulillah. So let me just say a little bit to begin. So this book is called Prophetic Grappling. Prophetic Grappling. And it's basically two parts. So the first part is written by this brother, Nisar Sheikh, who's actually a second degree black belt in jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and has studied different martial arts forms. And he teaches in the UK, lives in the UK. And the second part of it, or the end of it, is a small essay from Imam Suyuti. Uh, Imam Suyuti has come up before, but he died in 9-11, I think it was, after Hijra. And uh, he was very, very prolific. Like, he basically wrote about everything. So it's not surprising that you're like, huh, I wonder if anyone wrote about wrestling in Muslim history. And then you find that Imam Suyuti wrote about it. You're like, oh, okay, I'm not surprised. Like, he, he wrote about everything. SubhanAllah, it's amazing. Um, so, I, I, you know, when I first uh, told my wife that I wanted to do this book, she was like, that sounds like a really good book for a men's retreat. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I understand what you're saying. There is a section on here on women warriors from the time of the Prophet Wasallam, which we'll get to. But uh, I actually don't, th I mean, like, I agree. But part of why I think it's important to do this text is that we need to uh, take these kind of things more seriously. And uh, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> we talk many times here about the Hadith of Jibril, alayhi salam. And how the Hadith of Jibril teaches us that there's the mind and there's the body and there's the soul. So there's things in our religion that teach us how to deal with our mind. teaches things that teach us how to deal with our soul. There's things that teach us how to deal with our body. And sometimes the body is as simple as like, you should do this with people, you shouldn't do that. This is when you pray. This is, But there's a lot, that's the most basic facet. <clears throat> but there is a relationship between one's physical well-being and health. And their spiritual well-being. It's not necessarily that like you're automatically out if you're not physically healthy. But there is a relationship. And there's a reason why uh, so many of the people of knowledge and stuff, they really put emphasis on the food that they eat. There's a reason for that. Because the food that I eat has a consequence on my physical um, uh, constitution. And that has a consequence to my spiritual actual reality my emotional and spiritual reality so um for example i mean we know this right like sometimes we think oh my iman is just it's gotten so bad i just wake up and i don't feel good and my iman is so bad no your iman's not bad you haven't been eating properly and you're not getting enough sleep and you don't exercise and you're just depressed that's not your iman that's other things going on with you in your life that they are related, like your overall well-being is related to these issues are interconnected. And one of the things we find about the Prophet them is that that was very uh, real to him. You know, like the Prophet them is, we know from when we studied the Shaman, that he was very strong. You know, part of that, of course, is divine gift because he's the Prophet. But also it's because of the way that he lived, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like we have countless narrations, and he was very brave. You know, they there was a sound in the middle of the night that everyone was afraid, and they went out, they got to the outskirts of the city, and they saw the prophet riding back. And he's riding back on the horse with the sword just like thrown over his shoulder, and there's no saddle. And he's riding back and he's saying, It's okay, it's all right. I already checked it out, everything's fine. That's the prophet's in a long while. It's not just like you know, this really cuddly, you know, really sweet, cuddly guy. <laughs> which i think sometimes like that's our perspective it's just like the prophet must have been such a sweet cuddly guy like of course he was very sweet so along or something 
and he was very nice, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would eat very little, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would walk as if he's walking down, the speed at which he walked was as if he's walking down a hill. They say it was as if the earth was rolling up under his feet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he didn't sleep very much, not because he was trying to neglect himself, because he didn't need it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's very strong. Um, and this, of course, is the nature of his people as a whole. Like, I, you know, I think that sometimes we've probably seen it, like people who have traveled, even, even today, people have traveled, you've probably seen it. Like even in cities, you go to a city, you leave one city, you go to another city, but that life in that city is harder. And you see the people and you're like, wow, these people are tough. SubhanAllah, like they're just really strong. And if you take like someone from Orange County and you put them there, it's going to be tough for them. Like it's going to take some adjustment. They just don't have the same thing. It might not be that they have like the biggest muscles in the world, but they don't have the same strength. And I'm talking about like actual physical strength that sometimes people have. They have ability to bear things, right? which is important. If you if you want to do something, you have to have the ability to bear things, right? You have to just like, okay, I'm going to, I can handle it. It's a little bit hot. I can handle it. It's a little bit cold. I can handle it. I'm a little bit hungry. I can handle it. I'm very tired. I can handle it. I'm frustrated. I can handle it. I'm lonely. I can handle it. Like there has to be some, some like strength to the to the person, and this actually is a very fundamental issue to the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and who he was and the way that he was and the way that he taught people and the, the way that those people were Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Radiallahu Anhu. These people, like the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially in Mecca, these are a desert people. Like if you deal, if you meet and you deal with desert people, there's certain people you meet them, they're always strong. They always find them strong. People who live in the desert, they're always strong. People who live on the ocean, not like on the beach, like they're actually in the water, like on the boats all the time, sailors and stuff like that. They'll always be strong. You meet people who live in mountains, they'll always be strong. Uh, generally speaking, farmers, they'll always be strong. And if you think about it today, even like people think about different things, you can think about Muslims throughout history, so on and so forth. There are certain peoples, they're always strong. Sometimes it's just because they've always lived in conflict. Sometimes it's because they lived in conflict and they live in a place that also was difficult to live in. Like it's high in the mountains or it's in the desert or whatever else it might be. And human beings are stronger than, we, than they, we think we are. We're a lot stronger than we think we are. But, you know, experiences make people also a little bit tougher. So part of why I want to do this is because we have to, <clears throat> like, the martial arts, in a sense, like if you break it down in a very simple sense, the martial arts were a part of the life of the people around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was very much a part of their life. So it'll come up in here, but like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam definitely encouraged people towards certain things. He definitely encouraged people towards archery. He definitely encouraged people towards wrestling. He definitely encouraged people towards foot races, like being able to run and have some stamina and stuff like that. He definitely encouraged swimming, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And actually, like the sport, and there's a section here that will come. Sport in the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is not to throw shade on anything that people do now for fun or what I spent a lot of my life doing. It was purposeful. It was very clear. Like, you know, these people, they didn't have, we, we live in like these really comfortable modern, modern, comfortable modern situations where we're kind of like lulled into the illusion that life is always going to be like easy and comfortable and we'll always get what we want. And the most difficulty we might have is like, I don't know, we have to wake up early one day and like drive and AC to work. Like they were not under this illusion. These were people who knew at any time another people can come and raid your town and kill you and take all of your property and take your women and your children as slaves. This was their reality, right? So, I mean, this is it's a very harsh reality, but it's a reality. So that means that the way that you live is going to be different. Like one of the things that comes up here is that in the time of the Prophet them in Mecca, there's no standing army. Like, yeah, as Islam grows and like they start to conquer different lands and stuff, you start to have the idea of a standing army, right? Like a people who are conscripted to be soldiers and they're going to take care of your business, basically, <laughs> right? They didn't have that in Mecca. In Mecca, everyone who lives in the town is, is, a, is a soldier. At even the women a lot of times but like every basically every adult male is you can rely on them in that sense like they'll be able to handle certain things they can they can shoot an arrow they can run 
they can push some things, they can wrestle, they can get in a fight, they can handle themselves at some at some level, which uh, is really important to understand. Again, these are not just matters of like, oh, I want to be strong and like take pictures and post them on Instagram. It's not what we're talking about. Okay, it's a matter of like, and anyone who trains the martial arts knows this. Anyone, so there's some people in the room I can tell <laughs> that they do. Like you, there's it's not. He mentions it in here too. Like. <clears throat> there's a discipline to it. You do something every single day, you do something every other day. There's a, there's a discipline to that experience. Like the experience of, of grappling, there's a, it was like wrestling or submitting, submission, or wrestling, stuff like this. There's things you're going to learn from that spiritually, but you cannot learn other ones. Like you want to talk about building resilience, building patience, stuff like that. There's only so much patience you can build telling yourself you should be patient. But like, if you're going to train every single day, you're going to build patience. Uh, there's only so much humility you can teach yourself without like actually feeling the experience of choking. You're going to understand humility very differently when you're being choked than when you're not being choked. It's very different, right? You're going to understand humility very differently when your arm is going to break if you don't tap. If your arm's not going to break, it's just different. So that experiential knowledge is actually really important. There is something to this. It's not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. So the way of the Prophet ﷺ is to kind of uh, at least like, uh, you know, like human beings. I, I don't know how to explain this. Not everyone has to be like in the best shape or something, right? Not everyone has to like pretend like they're tough and stuff like that. This isn't it at all. But like people should not be like, um, not weak, but like, it's like sometimes I'm talking to my son and I'm like, stand here, you know, and he stands there. I just kind of like push him and he kind of just like, it <laughs> does that thing, you know, just like, and I'm like, can you just, just stand there? Like. Try it again. I can just push you. <laughs> what I'm trying, like human beings should not just be like that. Like that's that's not what Allah didn't make us like that. Allah made us with honor. Allah gave us strength. He gave us dignity. He gave us spiritual well-being. He gave us emotional well-being. Like we should be able to stand and things hit us and we don't fall. This is what I'm trying to say, right? Like something hits you and you don't fall. Or something hits you and you fall and you get up. And there's like some great clips actually of Muhammad Ali like that. Like one time when he got knocked down and he was up like immediately. You know, he's like, I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to get back up. And this is, a, there's, again, these, are, these things are all connected. We shouldn't fall for this uh, individualization thing. Like there's just physical strength and then there's being really smart. And then there's like making a lot of money. And then there's, I don't know, being whatever uh, that else might be. Because all these things go together. And we should seek to be well-rounded. Uh, and some interesting examples will come up in here. And many of the early scholars, by the way, they were like this. It's said about Imam Muslim, the collector of hadith, that he wouldn't write the hadith until he's done it. So he was actually known to be like a master archer. He was known to be really good at horseback riding and stuff like that. Because like, if I'm going to write the hadith, I have to know these things. Right? Like horseback riding, it's really a shame that we don't have that so much anymore. And... Uh, we had the chance to do it when we were in Colombia. Like it's it's a really interesting experience. You know, how many people have been horseback riding? Isn't it a really interesting experience? It's amazing. Like you sit on this horse and you feel like I, I felt like I really understood the idea of horsepower. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you sit on the horse and you feel like subhanallah, this is a powerful animal. But then at the same time, you know, like, okay, but I'm the one that's riding this animal. And we have to establish a relationship. We have to like understand each other. It's a really amazing thing. SubhanAllah. You have to feed it first. You, you have to feed it. You have to get it. You know, it's very amazing. So anyways, let's start the book. It has these different sections. Again, most of the intro stuff is like introducing the topic. Okay, so he starts off by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not going to read every single verse in this one. Uh, in the in the foreword, he says something nice. He says, Islamic wrestling, by which is meant wrestling per the Islamic code of conduct and practice, is amongst the most important sports and exercises in Islam, and via which a Muslim develops the strength and endurance to obey God and strive in his path. 
It is enough of an honor and privilege for Muslim grapplers who observe the Islamic code of conduct that the most beloved, our great prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, grappled. He grappled with Rukana, Ibn Abi Zazim, Abdul Yazim, who, which subsequently resulted in his conversion to Islam. So it's a famous narration. We went over it in the Shema too, that there was a man who was like the leading wrestler of his time. And <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ went to him. There's different narrations. But he basically went to him and look how like he understood how to talk to people. And that's actually a way of talking. So he told him, he said, if I beat you in wrestling, will you, con will you convert to Islam? He was like, what do you mean? Like, I'm the best wrestler of our time. And he's like, yeah, but if I beat you, will you become Muslim? He's like, okay. And he beat him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Like he grabbed him and they, they wrestled and he, he dropped him. And he was like, in some narrations, he asked for like another round. He's like, can we do it again? And he, he defeated him again, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, you know, some narrations, he became Muslim afterwards. But that's like, again, he knows how to talk to him, number one. And number two is that he defeated Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best wrestler in his time. Uh, that's very significant. Uh, if if you haven't done it, you probably wouldn't understand. Like, uh, and this is again like part of why it's important to do things. Like, if if you if you haven't experienced it, you wouldn't understand. But I can tell you, with like the very limited experience that I've had in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Like, it's a very interesting experience to like actually wrestle with someone who knows what they're doing. It doesn't matter. Like, you think you're an adult, you think you have some weight, like maybe a little bit of strength, and they'll completely destroy you as if you're nothing. You have zero independent will. Like, you know, we just sit there and they literally do whatever they want with me without even trying. So, when the Prophet, when we say the Prophet, who I send them, defeated the greatest wrestler in his time. Like that's really significant, actually. It's not just a, like, oh, that's a cool story type thing. And if you don't believe it, try it. Like, try actually wrestling with someone and see. You'll see, like, oh, okay. So they mentioned that in the intro. Then he continues. He praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the Muslims relish and endeavor to fulfill every prophetic practice, from his eating, sitting, engaging with the poor, dress, conduct with women, even to the very method by which he would relieve himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everything is there. In the sunnah, and we try to follow all of it, right? And one of the <clears throat> things that the Prophet Sallallahu did was the noble arts. Archery, swordsmanship, uh, horseback riding, wrestling. These were all established sports in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu It's been spoken about from time to time, but, you know, these are things that, there's some things, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the book and we're teaching it because, like, it's the, best thing we can do considering the circumstances we have, right? But what actually needs to happen is it needs to be done. <laughs> so why would you not write a whole lot about it? Is because if it's part of your culture, you don't need to write about it. You just do it, right? Like if everyone, if it's part of your culture, if you read, for example, the biography of Amir Abdul Qadir Jazairi, you guys know Amir Abdul Qadir and Jazairi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the great freedom fighter in Algeria who fought against the French. He was a sheikh, by the way. People think he was just like a fighter. Like he was a sheikh. His father was a sheikh. He was a sheikh. He was a sheikh of spirituality and a sheikh of knowledge. But you read about his early life and like the way that he was raised. He was like raised on a horse. They're raised in the desert, raised in, 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 in shooting arrows and raised in knowing the plants in the desert and how to use them and, and battle medicine and stuff like that. So you don't need to write about it because you do it. right? You, you don't have to sit and write a book about it. Everyone does it. So... We're just going to do it. So these kind of things, actually, we need a culture around them. That's my point that I'm trying to get at. Like, yeah, we read the book, but we actually need a culture. And the culture should be, in my opinion, especially when it comes to like wrestling, grappling, and these kind of things, is that people should train in these things, men and women. Uh, there's no reason why, you know, get the situation right. But women can do it, men can do it. And it's totally fine. And everyone will learn a lot and benefit from it, inshallah. We used to have it at the old majlis. Some of you maybe remember it. The old Majlis in Orange. We used to have open mat for the brothers on Sundays after the class. It was really nice. Until the, until like, you know, a little bit worried for the structure of the building. But for the most part, it was good. Alhamdulillah. So the Prophet, so I send them, they used to do these things. Uh, and this book is basically to talk about that. 
<clears throat> okay, history of grappling and Islamic civilization. There's a really cool footnote here. I'm going to read it, even though some people may not think it's as interesting as I do, but nonetheless. Uh, he starts off by saying, wrestling and by extension grappling in general has undoubtedly existed since time immor immemorial. So like a lot of people are like, well, where did this art form initiate and so on and so forth? Like everyone wrestles. <laughs> Every, everyone across the world wrestles. Old civilized and everyone, like, there's two things we know. Everyone went to battle. Like once human beings are human beings, everyone's going to battle. And part of that is going to be that everyone's wrestling. Like this is pretty, like this is the most fundamental engagement. Kids do it, right? Like you put kids in a room together, take away the screens and take away anything else for them to do. And within a few minutes, everyone's wrestling <laughs> and you're just hoping no one gets hurt and stuff. And like, that's what they're doing, you know? So grappling, here's the footnote on grappling. The difference between wrestling and grappling is one related to rules and objectives. One could argue that wrestling is a subset of the greater genre of grappling. Put simply, wrestling could be reduced to the art of taking an opponent down and pinning their shoulders to the ground. Grappling more widely would include stand-up wrestling, but also incorporate the use of submission, joint locks, chokes, and muscle compressions found in ground wrestling. Modern wrestling has been limited to two, two main strands, freestyle and Greco-Roman, both distinct from each other in, uh, in which techniques are permitted and have been Olympic sports since their introduction in 1900. Other grappling arts, such as sambo, judo, and jujitsu, adding the complexity of the gi, uh, with their myriad variations and rule sets broadly make up the remaining grappling genre. And then there's other things, right? So basically, there's questions on if we're standing, how do I get the person to the ground? And then there's questions on once we're on the ground, what do I do? Essentially is what it's coming down to. So we're saying that this has existed from the time immemorial. Uh, kids do this from the time when they're young. And the um, our guidance with the law is related to our struggle. That those who struggle in our way, they will be guided. There's many different kinds of struggle, but there is a guidance that we gain from struggling, even physically. Uh, here's some quotes that are interesting about Arabia. Now we go to Arabia, because we want to understand what was the context of the Prophet uh, One quote is, wrestling was a popular pastime among the boys of Arabia and they frequently fought each other. There was no malice in these fights. It was a sport, and boys were trained in wrestling as one of the requirements of Arab manhood. It's very common for them to do. Even, by the way, you look at it, like you watch these nature shows and stuff. What are the cubs of the lion doing and the cubs of the kid? The cubs are like sitting there, and they're like play fighting. They're wrestling, and they're playing. And doing that, they get to know themselves. That's one of the interesting things about wrestling, too, is like you get to know yourself in a way that you didn't know yourself before. You're like, oh, when I sit like that, I can feel it right there. But if I sit like this, it's a little bit different. And if I do this, there's pressure here and there's not pressure there. And okay, my body has a limit right there. And when I have that limit, I should turn a little bit and it's going to be a little bit different. Like all of these things you learn about yourself in the course of it. And for young people, it's very, very important. Another quote, raiding and fighting, as well as defending themselves against raids, were an integral part of their lives. The people in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Arabian culture was one of deep ancestral pride and tribal conflicts. You know, this is very common in the time of the Prophet. They were fighting each other all the time. Like you think about that story when they built, they rebuilt the Kaaba, right? Well, how does the story go? They wanted to rebuild the Kaaba. All of the tribes came together to rebuild the Kaaba and the people in Mecca. And they get to the last point and they have to put the black stone in. And then everyone's like, we're the ones that put the black stone in. So this tribe, they want to put the black stone. They want to put the black stone. They start arguing about it. Then they say they start, they brought like basically pots with blood in them, like animal blood in the pot. They stick their hand in the pot and they bring it out. And this is their sign to say like, all right, we're fight, We're going to disagree on this. We're willing to take this all the way. Like we're going to fight on this issue all the way to the end. And then they're like, maybe we should take an arbiter. <laughs> it's like things are escalating a lot. Like maybe we should get someone else's opinion. And they're like, all right, the next person who comes in, let's take their opinion. And that's when the Prophet them comes in and they're like, oh, Alhamdulillah, it's Sadiq al Amin. No, not Alhamdulillah, it's before Islam, but Sadiq al Amin, it's like the praiseworthy, the trustworthy, we're happy with his. And he deals with the situation, right? But that was the situation. Like they were ready to go to war amongst each other and these tribes over, over this, you know? And it happens all the time in the Meccan period. Like certain companions will get attacked, other ones don't get attacked. Why? Because like their tribe was really strong and like they're going to. So this was the reality of their situation. Uh, Arabian culture, Alexander the Great, arguably the greatest conqueror in recorded history, despite creating a dedicated navy 
to gather intelligence on this unknown land, Arabia, dispatching three naval missions and colonizing parts of the coastal areas of Eastern Arabia, failed in conquering such a hardy people in a hostile land. Like even Alexander the Great was like, okay, this, the heart of the Arabian desert, I can't conquer these people. These people are a different level of like, just toughness. No, this is before Islam. This is, they're, they're a different kind of toughness, like their way of life is just too difficult. We can't, we're not gonna be able to do that. So in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu with few marginal exceptions, all adult males were fighters. Uh, the military forces lacked any system of remuneration, fighting as they did for, for booty, honor, or self-defense, nor did they have any structure of command with coercive powers. It's not like, you know, you're going to get killed or something. There were certain tribal nodals, ashra no nobles, Ashraf, who owed their status to descent and other abilities, whatever. These are non-Muslims writing about it. The individual Bedouin tent preserved its own autonomy, just as it provided its own substance and the warrior his own weapons. People had their own weapons, like... This was the Prophet Sallallahu house. When you read about his house, what was in his house? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's like a small pot for food and things. And then there's something you sleep on, like a mat. And there's the Prophet's bow. And there's like his spear. And there's his sword. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's his house. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Maybe like one garment. That's his whole house. So this is the way that the people live. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another quote, after the conquest of Spain, the Arabs had already built a vast empire extending from the Atlantic shores to the Indus in about 100 years. While the Arabs began to develop their warfare system, they did not disdain to learn many lessons from the nations they already defeated. Arab writers and translators began to contribute invaluable treaties of, on war, archery, and chivalry. Again, people will look at this and be like, well, it's about war and stuff. You Muslims are always talking about war. Like, pre-modern world this was what everyone did <laughs> if you're if you're the like leaders of your people like what if you're like the prince what is the prince going to be trained in the prince is going to read of course the intellectual stuff they need to read and they're going to learn how to sword fight and they're going to learn how to ride horses and they're going to learn strategies of battle and war and so on and so forth i mean up to today people don't don't get like what is everyone everyone who's like in business and stuff what's the, everyone's favorite book the art of war Right. So like there's a reason there's a universality to the knowledge. You don't have to apply it to a battlefield, but there's a universality to the knowledge, to the understanding of how to interact and so on. In the sanctuaries, Mecca was very tough, as we mentioned. Even today, when you go, the experience of Mecca is very different than the experience of Medina. Right. You go to Mecca, it's like very rough, very hard, very difficult. You go to Medina, it's very soft. Like it's you can feel like it's an agricultural town. It wasn't this bustling trade center that Mecca was. But the Prophet Sallallahu goes from Mecca to, to Medina. And in Medina, of course, in the Medina period, there was a lot of battles and wars and stuff like that. Part of understanding of this is not just battle, right? But it's a way of living. The way of living of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a very, like you could call it, like it's, you know, you read books on like, how, how does a ninja live? Or how does a samurai live? Or how does, what's their code? Like the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in many ways, it's almost like a martial code. You know, you eat in a particular way. You sit in a particular way. Like it's makruh to eat while laying down. You guys know that, right? Like the Prophet Sallallahu specifically said, you don't like lay and eat and like this kind of stuff, you know? He, he sat and he ate in a very particular way. He he did things in a particular way, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so that there's a strength to the person. The mosque was a picture of simplicity, free from every kind of elaboration. The walls were made of unbaked bricks, the palm leaf roof, stood over pillars of palm tree trunks. The Qibla was in the direction of Beit al-Maqdis in Jerusalem, but then it was changed to Mecca and a new door was made. The floor was left to its natural unpaved state. The floor was normal, you know? It was just like whatever the floor is. It's kind of dirt, gravel, maybe like, you know, it's basically dirt and sand is the floor. Part of why that matters is what's going to come next, right? When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you ever think about it, you know, the story of when the Abyssinians were in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they were there on, I think it was Eid, and the Prophet Sallallahu is with Sayyidah Aisha, and it says that he's, she's like behind him, and she's looking, and she's watching them dance in the masjid, right? First of all, like, non-modern dancing, she, oh. it's usually very different than modern dancing, right? <laughs> it also, it usually looks like people are about to go to war, like they're kind of in a circle, they have some spears, they have some swords, they kind of like bounce around, and then they go to war. It's basically what dancing is. So when they're, they're dancing in the masjid, don't understand like a, a music video or something. <laughs> like they probably have some spears. They're making some circles. They're watching this dance. 
Where is the Prophet's house? She's watching from the door of her house. So where are they dancing? Dancing. Where are they doing this little like martial display in a sense? In the masjid. In the masjid of the Prophet's house and them. Probably in the Roda, actually, when you think about it. Where is the Roda, like this garden from the gardens of paradise? That's the most important place in the masjid of the Prophet. Where is it? There's a garden from the gardens of paradise between my house and the member. Between my house and the pulpit, right? That's the roda. If they're standing in the house of the Prophet and they're watching this, it's happening right there, not only in the masjid, in the roda of the Prophet. In this garden, from the gardens of paradise. He mentions this here. This is all summarizing what's mentioned here. He also mentions that there was an annual grappling examination of the young companions, which was overseen by the Prophet himself. So part of this is to understand, like, when they would go out to these battles and stuff in these wars, their resources are limited. Even you might recall in the um, the Battle of Hunain, I think it was Hunain, came up last week too, right after the conquest of Mecca. And they're going to go out to Hunain in this battle, but they just conquered Mecca. They didn't go back to like get all their weapons and stuff like that. So they borrowed weapons. Like there was a man in Mecca, they went to him. And they're like, we need weapons and things. So they borrowed them. He's like, you can't have them. Like, we're going to borrow them, give them back to you. He's like, okay, it's fine. Here's like a hundred chain mail. Here's some swords, stuff like that. SubhanAllah. So my point in this is like, when they go out to a battle, you don't have endless resources. So it's not like you just send out everyone. I'm just going to send out everyone. They're a liability. They don't have resources to arm them and stuff like that, right? So he's saying that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would send them. This was a serious matter. So they used to do this. Even in, I think it's in the Battle of Uhud. There were some young companions of the Prophet and they wanted to go to the battle. And the Prophet was like, no, you're too young to go to the battle. And they were like, no, watch. And they like actually fought. He's like they wrestled. They had a little exhibition match. And the Prophet was like, okay, you're fine. Like you're you're ready. You can go to this battle. Near, near, near the Masjid, uh, is called Masjid al-Sabaq. Like I mentioned, I think it came up last week as well. There are many things that happen in the life of the Prophet Later on, they become masajid. So, uh, actually, it was the other week, like Masjid al fatr when they had um, the Battle of the Trench, there was a place the Prophet would go, he'd pray, he'd make dua, right? And then they won the battle. So afterwards, the companions of the Prophet when they had a need, they would go to that same place on the same day and time that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi went there to make that dua, and they would pray to Raka'ah and they would make their dua. And then eventually a masjid got built there. So people would go, there's a masjid of Fatah, you know? There's masjid all around Medina like this, for these different things that happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So this place, is called the, it's basically called the masjid of the racetrack, or like the, the track. It's basically the masjid of the track, uh, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would have like, it was a dusty portion of land used for combat training, for horse racing, so on and so forth. They would have horse drills that they would do around there and stuff. And this was the area that was known for that. And later on became this uh, place. Also in the markets, usually if you're like in a small towns, then people will come from different places and they have market gatherings, right? Like a big pop-up market, uh, Okav and other things that happen in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And a part of this would be like people bring their wares, they sell things. Other people will bring their poetry. There were big poetry exhibitions in these places as well. And of course, there'll be battles, like a little wrestling match, a little thing. This is part of how uh, people would do things. So across the Muslim lands now. It's only half an hour. Wow. Across the Muslim world. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that the people amongst the Muslims, pe Muslim peoples who are most well-known for wrestling are the Persians. The wrestling is a, is a major part of Persian culture from before Islam through Islam and up to today. You know, uh, there's many things that were written about it in the ancient tales and the, in the time of the Prophet and tales, after tales. But wrestling is a very, very big part of Persian culture. They used to have these places called uh, Zor Khane, which is like a house of strength. You know, It's basically like a gym. But the people in the neighborhood, you know, the men, they would go to this place. There's usually like a pit in the middle, just like a ring. And you go there and you do your exercises and you do some techniques and you 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 stretch and you do whatever else you do. And then you have your little matches and people would uh, train on that. One of the good things, one of the good things about wrestling, which also makes it like really um, 
more useful for training, in a sense, is one of the, one of the teachers, one of the shuyukh, he said, if you were to split up the, the martial arts of the Prophet wasallam, there's basically two categories. One category is, how do you restrain someone without hurting them? And the other category is, how do you kill them? This is the only point, like, right? If you really, like, just break it down for a second, you don't fight for fun. So either you've, you're, you're trying to restrain the person so that nobody gets hurt, or you're trying to kill the person. So you're two options. So you have, like, sword fighting, spear fighting, archery. It's one category. And you have wrestling. And wrestling in some ways could be kind of both because maybe you're neutralizing them so that you could do the other thing. Or maybe you're just neutralizing the situation, trying to control it, right? Uh, so one of the good things about wrestling is that people can do it for extended periods of time without hurting each other, right? So like if you're training a, a martial art that requires striking, there's only so much striking you can do to, do to each other before somebody gets hurt, right? But in wrestling and the grappling arts, you can grapple and you can wrestle with each other for extended periods of time. You can try different things. You can learn different things without anybody actually getting hurt, right? And without hitting anyone in the face, because in the Sunnah, we try to avoid hitting anyone in the face, right? So this is also one of the reasons why grappling is an important martial art in that sense. Uh, it's narrated that during the Caliphate, this is an interesting paragraph. It's narrated that during the Caliphate of Muawiyah, the Roman Empire had sent two Herculean athletes one being particularly tall and wide, the other powerfully built with an immense grip to measure their strength against the soldiers of a Muslim army. Upon consulting with Amr ibn al-As, it was decided that Qais, son of the companion Sa'd ibn Ubadah, would battle with the tall one and Muhammad ibn Hanafiya, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, with the Roman powerhouse. As the caliph and the other dignitaries took their seats, the powerhouse walked across the field, meeting Muhammad ibn Hanafiya face to face. The challenge was set. Each man would extend their arm out while remaining seated and resist being pulled up by their opponent. It's not always that like, you know, it doesn't have to be something that's crazy violent or something. But they sit down, two people are sitting down, put your arm out and you see who can lift the other person. It's interesting, right? In the time of the prophets, I them, there were other ones they used to do. Like, there were people who were known for if they stand on a piece of leather and the, 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 the exercise is person stands on a piece of leather and you try to pull it out. And there were people who somehow, if you, they stand on that, nobody could pull them off. They're just like that, that firm in their stance. So this is the thing. See who can lift who. The Roman opting to be first grabbed the arm of Muhammad ibn Hanafiya as he sat fixed on the ground. Despite his efforts, the Roman was unable to move him from his place and acknowledged his weakness. Then Muhammad took his turn and with a dynamic jerk, immediately lifted the Roman into the air and threw him to the ground. This is something that happened, right? During the Abbasid dynasty, there was a resurgence of physical and sporting culture with the caliphate's capital Baghdad hosting lengthy horse tracks, maidans, horse polo, running, wrestling, or, and archery. Polo, by the way, like now we think about polo, like horse polo, it's like a rich people's sport, right? It's like the rich people do that thing. Because why? Because the royalty used to do that thing. So they learn what they need to learn in order to go to battle. You learn how to control the horse. You learn how to keep your balance. You learn how to move in different ways, so on and so forth. And then you use those techniques when you go into battle. right? But now we just look at it like, oh, that's the thing. Years later, at the time of the Buyid Caliph and Mustakfi wrestling tournaments were held in public squares, along with swimming races in the Tigris River, leading to the Buyid Amir Mu'izza Dola hosting regular wrestling competitions. Wrestling matches of the 4th, 10th century held at the bidding of the Mu'izza Dola at Baghdad present a remarkable scene. On the day of the wrestling competition, a tree was set up in the race course with prizes containing valuable things hanging, like bags of money. Musicians would come and they play music and stuff like that. And then these like, it was like an Olympics, right? People go and they engage in these different uh, spectacles. Wrestling, of course, also, but it's not the Persians only. Uh, the Indian, like South Asia, has actually a very long-standing tradition of, of wrestling and martial arts. Uh, the Turkish areas, of course, have uh, long-standing wrestling traditions as well. So basically, you're going to find it everywhere. It's an interesting point he mentions here. The grandson of the renowned Indian Hadith scholar Shawaliyullah Dandani 
So Shawali Umar Dahlawi is a really interesting person. Just to give kind of like some scholarly context. Shawali Allah. Like a lot of the scholarly tradition of the subcontinent goes back to him. All the different brands, all the different strands, everyone goes back to him. You look at the chains of narration, the books of hadith, the books of knowledge, everyone goes back to him. So he's a very central figure. Shawali Allah Dahlawi. Shawali Allah of Delhi. Shah Ismail, that's his grandson, Shah Ismail. And they were a family of scholars, like his father, Shah Wali Allah's father and his children and his children's children. There were like several generations of people who were scholars. Shah Ismail was known for his proficiency in the prophetic martial arts and regularly swam over 200 kilometers from Delhi to Agra along the Yamuna River. Okay. Not content with his literary attainments, he wanted to be a true man of action and acquired high proficiency in all sorts of martial arts. He was a fine writer, clever marksman, fearless lancer, and skillful wrestler. Okay, and then there's other martial forms that had different styles. Of course, the Mongolian armies, they used to emphasize horsemanship and archery and wrestling along with that. Uh, the Muslims who were in China also had like a very strong wrestling tradition that became incorporated into the martial arts of the Chinese armies and stuff like that. Uh, there's many interesting points in here. Uh, Shalabi, who was like a very famous Ottoman travel writer and stuff, has a lot of things where he talks about wrestling. Uh, I've actually dug them up before. They're not in here. I don't know where I saved them, but there's some really interesting du'as and things. Like they had set du'as that they would say before a wrestling match. You know, they say like, Bismillah, Salatu Asama, Bismillah. Then like specifically mentioned Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, in the du'a, because Sayyidina Ali was like this great martial figure, right? So then they mention him, they make du'a for him, and they invoke his name. And stuff like that. Uh, many of the Ottoman khulafa, actually, like the Ottoman sultans, many of them were proficient wrestlers. Like very, they'd like wrestle with their retinue, their internal retinue. People would like challenge matches with each other and they'd have matches. And it's very interesting. Now listen to this story. The Ottoman Empire lived for war. Every governor in this empire was a general. Every policeman was a janissary. Every mountain pass had its guards. And every road had a military destination. The most willowy, willowy and doe-eyed page boy this must be a non-Muslim writing. Yeah, it is. It's always interesting to see, you know, like that Orientalism little thing. What is that about? The most willowy, willowy and doe-eyed page boy. Was a dab hand with the jarret or the bow and well-versed in wrestling, the king of Ottoman sports. At the siege of Baghdad in 1683, when the Persians demanded the contest be decided by single combat, they put up a Herculean warrior from their ranks and Sultan Mehmed IV took him on himself. So they put forth, they said, okay, let's start the battle with the one-on-one -on -one thing. So they put forth their biggest warrior. The Sultan is the one who went out. It wasn't like send someone else. The Sultan went out himself, took him on himself, splitting the Persian champion's mailed head in two with a single blow. Mailed like he's wearing chain mail, split his head in two with a single blow. Uh, in recent times, the success of several Muslim MMA fighters originating from the Caucasus, a land of mountainous and rugged terrain, has inspired a new generation. Many attribute their harsh and indefatigable combative style of fighting to the land from which they originate. Dagestan specifically, but the Caucasus more generally, this area has experienced lots of conflict and they have very strong warriors. We've mentioned before, uh, I mentioned earlier, Amir Abdul Qadir al Jazairi, who fought the French in Algeria. At the same time period, actually, and they actually met each other. And in, in, in this region of Dagestan, Chechnya and stuff, there was, um, um, it's part of my mind just went completely blank. What was his name? Someone tell me his name. Uh, the, I mean, the, the sheikh was the head of the fighting and the resistance against the Russians. Huh? Nobody knows his name? Huh? This is too much aib for me to handle. I'm gonna like disappear into the earth right now. It's too much aib. I can't remember his name. Anyways, again, he was similar to Amir Abdul Qadim and that he was a sheikh of knowledge and a sheikh of spirituality and the leader of the resistance. So they say like one time that uh, the Russians attacked where he was and they, the Russians actually narrate this. They surrounded him 
and they thought like, okay, we got him. And then he jumped over them, killed all the guys that were around him, and disappeared into the mountains. They were like, who is this guy? Disappeared into the mountains, and like, you know, amazing. This is all modern stuff, by the way. It's not like 7,000 years ago or something, like 100 years ago, 200 years ago type thing. Um, it's kind of like, I can't remember. Uh, no. Huh? Imam Shaman. That's the one. Imam Shaman. Yeah, that one. Imam Shaman. Look him up. Amazing. <clears throat> You'll see them. They, it's a very interesting cultural thing, actually. By the way, like Muslims, they love turbans. Wherever Islam went, the Muslims always wore turbans. The men, of course. They wore turbans. You go to a region, turbans aren't. People will be like, oh, the turbans are Arabian thing. Okay, so why are the Muslims wearing turbans in Indonesia? Because of the, the Prophet size and them wore a turban. They like the turban. You look at these these uh, in the Caucasus region, you see it. You'll see it. If you look up pictures of Imam Shaman, you see it. They have like that Russian type hat, the like big wool hat thing. And there's a huge turban tied around it. So it's like the local kind of hat. And then we'll tie it. But we're not going to give up the turban. We tie the turban around the hat. It's beautiful, actually. SubhanAllah. You'll see it. You look up the pictures, you'll find it. This region, actually, in the modern period, have won an extraordinarily a disproportionate amount of championships in wrestling. Like they, they're known to produce the wrestlers. Okay, so that leads us to part two, which is martial warriors among the companions of the prophets and along where they will send them. Inshallah, we'll continue here next time. Talk about some of the companions of the prophet from the men and from the women who were known for their martial prowess. And then from there, there's like another small section. And then we get to Imam Suyuti's collection, which is just hadith actually. It's maybe like a handful of hadith. It's very short. So we'll continue next time. Any comments or questions, observations, anyone has? Yes. Um, I don't know. But I would imagine there are. I know there's... um. And there are people who, like, if you push them, they'll help you. So, like, in our community, there's two places, um, at least. There's a number, actually. Like, in the Muslim community, we have some people that are actually really advanced. Uh, there's Empire. Uh, there's a gym called Empire Training Grounds that Omar Subha runs with his brothers. And he's, like, I don't know what degree black belt. But, like, if Muslim women want to train there and stuff, he'll accommodate it. And do it in a way. The other thing with like jujitsu and stuff is that you're largely covered. So even if a woman wears like full hijab, you could kind of like there's a way you can dress for jujitsu, even if men are around, but you're training with women and stuff, you could pull it off in a sense. Traditional bow, yeah. Yeah. Me. We were going to, and uh COVID happened, number one. And then the second thing that happened is we had a brother who came to the Medjus all the time, who was actually very proficient with the traditional bow. He even went into competitions that people would come with crossbows and stuff, and he would go with the traditional bow and compete. But he moved recently to the Bay, so we lost him. He wanted to do some stuff and like, would, you know, but inshallah, you know, we tried to do something as things are getting more open and stuff. Inshallah, it would be nice to do that. What about firearms? Firearms is kind of like a mod legitimate modern extension of the bow. Uh, you know, firearms training is a good thing. Alhamdulillah, we have Second Amendment. There's no reason to not uh, to not at least have some knowledge of it. I know that people take different perspectives on this, and Californians are generally very, some Californians, I should say, very much lean to one side on this. But uh, I'll tell you one thing. When I was in the middle of the Egyptian Revolution, I really wish that I had a gun and I wish that I knew how to use it. So, you know, hopefully you never have to use it, but doesn't mean it's not good to know it. You know, someone had their hand up over here. Yeah. Uh, is there a story to go? Someone in the time of the prophet told us that that's why they had the right to execute, to kill, to, to maim, or whatever, but the prophet preached patience first to pull back the last throw. 
that the prophet preached it? I mean, if they said they were Muslim or something like that, there's several incidents like that where someone would be like in the middle of the battlefield and they're about to get killed. And then they say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And they're like, what do you mean? You know, <laughs> and the prophet specifically said that if someone does that, you can't attack them. You know, they're like, well, they're faking it and stuff. Like, it doesn't matter if they're faking it. If they said that, you can't attack them. So there's incidents like that. Otherwise, I don't know. There probably are, but I don't know that one comes to mind for me. There's the famous story of Sayyidina Ali, right, who was in the battle and he was going to kill the guy. And uh, the guy spit on him. And then he stopped. And he's like, what are you doing? He's like, well, when I was first fighting you, I was fighting you for the sake of Allah. But after you spit on me, it became about me. So then I stopped. And it's said that the guy actually became Muslim in that context. But it's not exactly your question, but it's kind of related. Um, but generally speaking, you know, like forgiveness is good. And peace is good. And there is a rule, like in the Quran, you can fight if you have to fight, but if people are willing to have peace, then you have to accept them. You can't just like, you know, keep going because you feel like it type thing. Mm -hmm. um, what about unconditional? Does Islam accept unconditional surrender? Like, to push for unconditional surrender when the opponent wants conditional surrender for conditional peace. But no, you want unconditional surrender, you surrender entirely. I'm sure this happens in many conquests of Islam where they come to a city and they conditionally surrender, but maybe the Muslim general keeps pushing for unconditional surrender. I don't know. All of this is outside my realm of expertise. But that's an interesting question. I would imagine that a lot of it would come down to strategy. You know, it would, it would be left to the strategic decision of the person. Um, but, for example, like generally, it wasn't the thrust of Muslim civilization that you destroy the place that you're conquering. They wouldn't destroy things. Right? As much as you can not destroy, you don't destroy it. Right? And let life go on as much as you can. And you don't just like wipe out a people and take over an island and destroy the entirety of the indigenous population or wipe out indigenous peoples and stuff like that. That wasn't the way that Muslim conquests went. They were conquests, but generally, I mean, pre-modern thing is very different too. Like most of these villages and stuff that got conquered, they didn't really, like their life was very detached from central governance. So they'd be like, okay, we're in charge now. They're like, okay, <laughs> we just pay our tax to someone different and you're going to give us security. Like, okay, fine. It wasn't so like, pre-modern world is very different. It's like Afghanistan, like it happened recently. The new government took over and what happened with what, 72 hours? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anything related to Afghanistan, I usually refrain from comment on. Afghanistan is very complicated. You can, complicated. You can ask the Afghans their opinions. It's very complicated. Ask Yomar and ask others. Yomar is here. <laughs> you know, ask the people what they think alhamdulillah all right anyone else have anything yes That's the story. That's the story. <laughs> You're good. That's the love. Show mercy on Carmel people. Um, yeah. In the hope that eventually they would look at his actions and his mercy toward them and perhaps, you know, accept Islam or listen to a message or change their behavior or their manners. Definitely. Yeah, there's many stories like that. I understood the question to be related to the context of battle, but like, there's many stories like that. There's times when the Prophet saw something, people tried to attack him, he forgave them. Lots of stuff. You know, there's many, many examples like that. Definitely. 
Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's not self driving. You're not on your phone. <laughs> oh, alhamdulillah, it was great. <laughs> I was scared. Yeah, I was scared, but alhamdulillah, it was okay. I part of the challenge for us was that we went horseback riding with the family that we know in in Colombia. So the people who were taking us, they didn't speak English. So it wasn't like the guy who was with me, I could talk to him and like ask him questions and stuff. I couldn't. It was like you just gotta figure it out. And assume that if I'm about to die, he's going to help me. <laughs> um, everything was fine. How long? Did you no, 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 maybe like an hour or something. I was with myself and my wife and the brother's wife. He went somewhere else because he does horseback riding all the time. So he like went to his own area to do his own thing. I was like, bro, you're supposed to be with us. <laughs> I'm like, <"What's... laughs> he left us, and then, and then the kids had like their own. The kids also went horseback riding. So like my my daughter went horseback riding and my son. And that was actually their favorite thing of the whole trip. Were they on like baby horses? Yeah, they were on like smaller horses. We weren't we weren't on like these huge <laughs> yeah. thoroughbred type horses. They were like <laughs> they weren't so big. But it's a really interesting experience. Like you really feel on a lot like um, I don't know, you have to do it. It's hard to explain. You have to do it. But go somewhere where like you can trust the people and stuff. Apparently, this place we went to was like one of the best places for horseback riding in the whole country. So like they really trusted them and everything. So it was fine. It's really beautiful. Another nice thing is that a lot of places in Medellin, at least, they have places for kids everywhere you go. So like you go to the mall, there's handicap parking, and then there's families with kids parking. It's amazing. You go horseback riding, there's a huge playground for the kids. They go horseback riding, they play on the playground, they go horseback riding. It's amazing. It's fun and beautiful. It was a nice experience. Inshallah, we can go more. But, you know, America is very expensive. <laughs> so I don't know if we're going to be able to. But alhamdulillah, everything, it was a good experience. Anyone else have anything? Yeah. Interesting. So brother is saying he had heard before that the Prophet them only killed one person actually in all these battles. <clears throat> and that was because the person was basically about to kill him. And so he had to. Allahu alam. I don't know. I ha I've, I've never heard that before. It could be true. I'm not personally inclined to believe it, but it's possible. It's, uh, it's, it's also true that in these battles, not that many people died. Like comparatively speaking, not that many people died. So there would be like, you know, a big battle and maybe 50 people died on both sides. Big battle, 100 people die, which on modern terms is like, it's a very small number, you know, but it's possible, I guess. No, I don't, I don't know. We would just disarm them. I mean, I suppose it's possible. No, I don't, you know, um, again, I'm not, I don't know. I, I haven't like read about that in detail. I haven't specifically come across that. Just thinking about it, I'm not. It's possible. He's the prophet. So I don't know. It's definitely possible. But he made dua against more than one person who died. <laughs> so I don't know how we make balance that one. But anyways, yeah. The book is called Prophetic Grappling. Prophetic Grappling. I don't actually know, to tell you the truth. Uh, one brother, when it came out, he sent it to me. Because, like, you know, we, I think he took his first jujitsu session at the Mejlis. So when it, when it came out, he wanted to send it to me. So, uh, 
I'm not really sure. You might find it on Amazon. There's yeah, a there's Islamic, there's Islamic bookstore, bookstore in Anaheim. Anaheim. It's, called, it's right next to the old... Yeah, Jareer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jareer yeah. <laughs> has a lot of books, a lot of books yeah. but there's have. a lot of books in English now. You could try, yeah. but I think he said you could find it on Amazon. Yeah. Anyone else? Dinner time? Alhamdulillah. So it's very